Hey everybody, I am Tony Goldmark, aka Some Jerk with a Camera, and this is the commentary for my three-part Escape from Tomorrow review from 2015. Joining me are... I'm David Gantel, aka Doggins, aka the guy who shot about half of this review. I was lied to and was told that we were going to be watching something else, so... <laughs> This is begrudgingly Nicholas Bogrov Ganzel, a.k.a. Bogrov, one who shot the other half of the review. -ish. Yeah, we're, we're doing the death of a porn crew commentary tomorrow. Sorry about that, Nick. You told me it was today. I have a lot to say about that. It was a traumatizing time. But this is for uh, my Escape from Tomorrow review. Now, both Ganzels joining me today have seen the movie Escape from Tomorrow, so they can Unfortunately. speak from a place of experience of how bad it is. And uh, and they both helped me uh, shoot this. Basically, they, they sh between them, they shot... About 99% of this uh, video. Now, Jerks with Cameras, this was a real MTV show that was on MTV in like 2013, 2014, somewhere around that. I remember first reading about it and thinking, well, that's it. My web series is over. Like, I, I got to come up with a different name for my show because this thing will become, you know, the New Jersey Shore or something. And then it actually aired and it was the dumbest thing ever. And these clips actually, they came from the MTV YouTube channel. They, sh they uploaded a bunch of clips from it. And it was just this dumb, horrible prank show. And fortunately, it only lasted eight episodes and no one ever have heard from it again. Can so. I just take a moment and say how much I love the editing in this scene? Like, it, it, it so viscerally encapsulates how bad this show must have been. Yeah, and yeah. All, all of the dialogue you have surrounding it. I also love that moment, but all the dialogue you have surrounding it about like, oh, I have an idea. Let's make the most retarded prank show. Yeah. The I apologize. Just I apologize, by the way, for using the R word. I, 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 I wouldn't have done that if I was doing this today, so I apologize for that. But um, anyway, but yeah, it is weird that I do this whole segment on that show and then never bring it up again. But I don't know. I guess that fits. Now, this speech right here is kind of something I've thought for a while, and I know it's reductive, and I know it's a generalization, but I really feel like we don't need film festivals anymore. I, I would actually, I would go the other way and say, we don't need these film festivals anymore. Okay. We need film festivals, but they need to be, like, for actual independent content. Well, what I'm saying was, you know, in back in the day, if you were trying to start out as a filmmaker and you and you wanted to show yourself and you wanted to get a lot of exposure for it, you'd take your film to a film festival, and that's how it would happen. Nowadays, we have YouTube, and so you just, you just upload your work. It, I'm saying that's where the young filmmakers today are going. They're not going to film festivals. They're just uploading their stuff to YouTube. I think there's still a certain benefit for festivals in terms of just the networking opportunities. I mean, they exist because of seniority, basically, because the because the film establishment still wants them to exist. They're definitely no longer as essential to the process as they used to. Like the Kevin Smiths uh, of the world. I love that guy. I don't want to but this this speech about pointing a camera at someone's face and pressing a button. Yeah, I love the shit out of that speech. Well, we I, and it is again reductive, and I and people have called me out on that, and and you know. I, yeah, you're right, but I'm also, you know, I'm having fun with this stuff. I also love that you're just now finding out they're owned by Comcast while you're facing the building that has Comcast. <laughs> that is amazing, really. I know, and and, and the thing is, yeah, so, and, and that's like a slum that's near my neighborhood where I live. Uh, probably shouldn't be saying that because then people will piece together where I live. But the, uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to use this review to deflate a lot of the easy arguments that people have against Disney. One of, one of them, of course, being, you know, Disney's an evil corporation. Well, yeah, but it's not the only evil corporation. You know, pretty much everything nowadays is owned by a corporation and they're all evil, especially Comcast, for God's sake. So there are like three or four quick things I want to address that we talked over just right, right. well, well first time, so, I, yeah. I need to talk at least briefly about this scene this was shot at magfest 2015 and uh and, and a, a bunch of pe a bunch of our there's really me. good friends are in yeah there's you dave a bunch of our really good friends are in this scene uh basically everyone we knew who was at magfest that year is 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 sitting in this circle here 
because I wanted a lot of people. And of course, Linkara has a cameo later. And at one point, I called Disneyland Dismaland. And this was before Banksy released his... Di it, it was shot before that, but it was released after. And by the way, this Ryan and Chris cameo here, that was originally written for Jack and Josh when I thought they would be at MAGFest because they had been at the previous MAGFest, but, but they, they didn't, didn't, make it they that didn't go. So instead of Jack and Josh, I had Ryan and Chris right there. Um, but but yeah, the, uh, the, this pre this was shot well before that whole Banksy Dismal Land thing was announced. So that blows just, my mind. It, I, it was just a stroke of luck, really. I didn't know about that line until it was released, and when yeah. I saw it, I went, "Oh, he's referencing Banksy." I did. Yeah, no, it, it was that was. It, I mean, it shows how easy that pun is. Yeah. I mean, it was the sad thing. I didn't realize it was a pun at first. I was like, "That's weird." Why? Did, it took me forever to go, "Oh, Dismal." I get it. We also have to talk about Zach dressed as Pinocchio, which yeah. he just brought that. <laughs> costume to Magfest. Yeah, he was just cosplaying it on, on his own volition. So that was a last minute addition to the scene. It was. That Magfest was just a couple weeks after you drove out here and a couple weeks before I drove out here. Dave was pointing at me in case anyone was yeah, curious. Nick drove out here to move out here. Yeah, no, I missed that Mag. That was the first... Well, and Lewis I went was to the two Magfest prior to that. I didn't go to that. Yeah, one. and Lewis was great to work with. And you'll notice in that shot, Dave is also in the shot, and he's looking more at the camera than at Lewis. I was trying to be looking at you, but I was bad at it. Turned into kind of a Jim Halpert thing. And this Ben. Okay, real quick, right here. This observation about it being a Ben Stiller character, mm -hmm. that is more insightful than anything <laughs> Randy Moore has ever said. Because when, watch when watching that interview, I was suddenly like, yeah. Ben Stiller does usually play passive characters who are thrust into ridiculous circumstances. Under a different director, this script would absolutely be a Ben Stiller comedy. And Randy Moore, compl the, the, the lengths to which Randy Moore rejects it in that little clip on the, on the Vice YouTube channel, uh, that it, it, it just seems so funny to me because it's like, dude, embrace it. It's a Ben Stiller archetype. Why are you rejecting this? And so I had to make fun of it. And yes, the Escape from Tomorrow DVD was available at Target I for a while. I worked at Target at the time, that it, and I saw it there. And I remember I texted David a photo like, you will not fucking believe what is here. <laughs> It, because when we watched Escape from Tomorrow, we just found a... a I, I googled it and yeah. found a pirated copy online. It was actually easier to find pirated copies than it was to find it for purchase on Google. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, real quick, to throw back like five, ten minutes now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, the first shot of you, to all come to this place. Yeah. I remember when we were walking around that area, and you went, here, I want to shoot the first bit here. Now, you were, that, that wasn't you. That was with, really? with Dave. Really? I thought yeah. that was the first day that we were... No, no, no. I you remember. Well, uh, the conceit with this is that I'm starting in basically my neighborhood, and I'm gradually going west. Okay. I'm gradually going west, and eventually. And now, now there's a little. I thought it was the same day we shot all this stuff. Now like, I played in this neighborhood. No, this, this is Dave too. Dave shot this stuff too. Now the uh, I'll, I'll let you know when it's wow, when okay, it's my your memory stuff. Must suck. Yeah, I guess you've just watched this so many times. Well, you... no, it's, I, I... Maybe we shot a take of it on my day, but you used the take on it, because I remember... I don't think so, but, but, yeah. but, but we'll get into that. But basically, the idea is I'm gradually heading like west. Commentary. Yes, know, exactly. Right? Gradually, I'm, I'm heading west, because eventually... This is just a therapy session up. for me, working on my poor memory skills. Because eventually, I end up at the Pacific Ocean and, uh, and, and the Santa Monica Pier and all that. Now, I, I play pretty fast and loose with this for the sake of specific gags. Like, like you just saw me at the Ferris wheel. I love this more you know thing. That was... I do love that you got the footage at the Ferris wheel that they shot on. Yeah, exactly. At, at the Santa Monica that Pier. That adds a lot, I think, to the aesthetic. Because even when you're not shooting in the Disney locations you're shooting at, you can still use their location. Well, right, it, right. It, 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 it's actually, when, when you guys shoot at, like, the Disney parks, there's often a level of thinking about the... Uh, the which location like sometimes it's like I don't know we'll shoot this here but a lot of times it's like I want to shoot this in front of this bit right. because it subtly thematically connects even if no one else picks up on that yeah I do that a lot just just for the sake of my own like little ego trips like here's a joke only I recognize haha <laughs> I win watching some jerk with a camera is basically baby's first introduction to mise en scene <laughs> Sure, why not? Okay, this production designer's bit. There's Zach again. There's Zach. And, uh, and by the way, Nick, I wrote this bit for you. Oh, I wasn't I w there that day. Yeah you, uh, yeah, you weren't available that day. It was specifically because Zach already played Pinocchio in the previous scene, so I wanted to switch it up a little. And I wasn't at MAGFest uh, to be in the circle. But Zach was available. Well, and you wouldn't have gotten into the yeah. Pinocchio outfit anyway. You wouldn't have fit. But I could have played Artie. But, 
uh, yeah, yeah, but the um, uh, but, but but yeah, Zach was available this day. You weren't. So, but but Zach did an amazing job. And there's a bit with the mustache coming up where the timing is just absolutely perfect. And I, I want to point it out that stupid mustache. This was after several takes of legitimate fuck ups with the mustache. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a cumbersome mustache. Uh, this was shot on a green screen in our backyard. Right, right. And and the wind was a problem as well. I remember. This was in our backyard. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. And but and okay. I, I turn my head away at the exact moment the mustache is about to fall off. That is such perfect timing. It, it made the accidents look choreographed. Like, it is. Like, it was, like, it's like fucking Blake Edwards up in here. Yeah, it's so great. My favorite line in that whole bit is when he goes, and it has to be this. Yes. <laughs> like, like, he's given the hard sell on how much can I milk at it. It's like, fuck, man, you're not giving me a lot of options, but right, it has yeah. to be this. You know, if you, I am a genius and can make this work, yes. but it's going to cost you. You're going to pay through the nose, but you'll get what you pay for. Yeah, I do love little details like that. Up next, we have Gary the Gorilla Gorilla, one of two recurring characters. I probably should have just picked one and stuck with it, but I instead... I disagree. <laughs> I fundamentally disagree. They are both amazing. Now, this took forever to edit because I just... That's a little plastic gorilla that I've had for forever. In fact, if you've gone down into the deep recesses of my YouTube channel and found a film I made in college called Radio Yeah, there's stuff I do with that gorilla in Radio Yeah using the same voice. Using the same like you know oh I I'm Gary the Gorilla Gorilla and I think the Baba da Ba and you like and that was, so this was kind of a throwback to that he really is an old friend yeah that that's the that's the gorilla voice I use and it took forever to edit just because I was moving it around with my hand and it's so small that it was moving all over the place and then to blow it up to that size and then make it stay in frame the whole time was really a pain in the ass no hurry. I'll patiently I need to wait. talk about the movie itself for a second because there's a lot of footage in this movie of them just experiencing attraction. Yep. This is the only one where the attraction itself is actually thematically relevant to what little story it is. Exactly. Because she has this line here about witches aren't real. Even the other rides where, like, things happen on them... It doesn't matter which ride they're on. Like, this making out yeah, scene could yeah. have been on any ride. The small world demons could have been on any ride. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it does make some sense for it to specifically be small world just because that's such a happy slappy It wouldn't do. not make sense to have it on Winnie the Pooh. You know, it wouldn't not make sense. Like... I get uh, no, no I, I I understand why the demons were on Small World I do understand why they but, chose Small World, but the fact that they do basically the same scene again later on Grand Fiesta shows that yeah. it it wasn't as integral. Uh, the fact that it was Small World wasn't as integral. By the way, I love you singing Masochism Tango. Oh yeah, that that, that, that was fun. It, it, that, that came kind of out of desperation. It's like, what jokes can I? Oh, the music sounds a little like a tango, so. There you go. Well, and I, 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 the thing, I think the fundamental flaw of this movie... Just is, one? <laughs> no, no. The biggest fundamental filmmaking flaw mm -hmm. is the fact that as a criticism of Disneyland and Disney World that's trying to look dark and fucked up and scary, it makes Disneyland look so much fun. Like, yeah. when we were watching it back in Connecticut, that's how long ago we watched this, we were like... God damn, I miss going to Disneyland. Like, yeah, that, that was mean, the feeling it evoked from me from seeing all these things. And I do bring that up later of, of nothing in this movie, uh, none, of the, none of the bad stuff is Disney's fault, which was your suggestion, and a great suggestion, by the way. Well, thank you very much. And that footage of the It's a Small World clock was shot way back when I actually shot the It's a Small World review. It was just some B-roll I got for it. But to get to the point where you can get that shot, you have to actually ride the ride, and then it's on your way out. And I was not going to ride that ride again, so I just used the old footage. And that whole bit was actually kind of an apology for devoting so much of the Small World episode to an extended rape joke, which really wasn't cool of me. I never got any serious flack about it. I guess I accidentally handled the subject with enough respect, but if I'm being brutally honest with myself, I didn't really do it for any reason beyond just to be edgy, so that joke is kind of my apology for that. Speaking of filmmakers who should be apologizing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. Okay, so the thing about this scene is... This could work. Oh, yeah. If it was more understated, and if the whole film was like that. Like, clearly he's trying to go for this David Lynch, like, 
bizarre. Like a lot of what's things, real, what's not real. Well, yeah, and a lot of the things you point out that don't make sense and that are unlike make the characters unlikable could work in a horror film. If it's like, no, you're supposed to feel uncomfortable around these characters. You're supposed to not like them. But because he doesn't know how to control the tone of the movie and doesn't know how to keep these feelings of discomfort like perpetual throughout it, it doesn't work. Yeah, that's very t- Now this stuff was shot with you, Nick. Everything from the mural with with the with the cell phone and No, cuz I definitely it's the the stuff outside of the the apartment building look because of the greenery looks similar to that neighborhood. Okay, now n- now this stuff with the uh, with the infomercial parody, I used s- clips of the audience from a infomercial parody they did on Mr. Show where they couldn't afford to hire extras, so they just used their friends and their friends were like Jack Black and Paul F. Tompkins and Scott Ackerman and and Bill Odenkirk and all these people who are very fit. and that's a little distracting. I kind of wish I'd actually like tried to find a real infomercial where they cut back to an audience and just use that. I'm not instead. gonna lie, I didn't notice. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, uh, it, uh, it, matter of fact, I'm not sure it needed this whole introduction. I'm not sure. I, I, I feel like if I had just gone straight to introducing Cinecile, it, I, well, you, I you love shot, the shit out of that introduction. You shot though. this bit a year after you shot the actual. Cinecile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this Cinecile stuff was shot at Magfest 2014, so almost two years before it was actually used in the video. Because uh, Kyle was there, and that's where we shot the opening credit. Now in high Inside, I could have just waited until he was in town in Southern California to shoot the Beauty and the Beast review to shoot this stuff, but I decided, eh, we're here. Let's just let's just get this over I, with. I think you decided that would be a much tighter schedule when he was actually. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And and all we needed. Oh, and this was of course shoot when we shot the uh, shot when we shot the Beauty and the Beast stuff. Uh, uh, all the Cinecal stuff, by the way, shot with my flip cam. Some of the last flip cam footage that actually made it into a. a a, a some jerk episode and uh, and of course with the Magfest stuff I figured well I'll decide later what he's actually saying so we can just shoot it there and shoot a couple variants and make How it long work. How did that take to edit with the lip moving to make it like because you can see that there's a little bit of reversing and playing forward to make it last the right amount of time? It was a bit of a challenge but ultimately not insurmountable. One thing I wish we had done is shot with a tripod because there's a couple of bits yeah. including later when his, when his head turns into the blue screen of death. I really wish we had we had shot that on a tripod so that so that his so that it wouldn't be as jumpy and his head could really turn into it as opposed to just you know going all over the place there so yeah this is this is an observation um it, it's true i mean you really can't ride you, you can't ride all these rides in the time it takes to wait for buzz lightyear which this is one of your you don't meet the characters outside the grand floridian right exa- exactly and by the way it wasn't my intention at all because I decided I was going to do the ABC videos long before I even knew this movie existed, but I'm really glad it worked out this that way because this movie is kind of a bizarro universe version of those episodes. Okay. This thing with the, the background extra, Dave, I think you were the one who noticed with, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. We yeah. were noticing it with that first night Nick and I watched it. I was like, I love that dude back there who just clearly doesn't know why these people are leaving. I think so we rewound it and rewatched it just to laugh a second time at that dude's expression. Because he turns back and just gets right on the ride. It's like, what the fuck is those guys' problem? Also, it's like, I'm at Disney Park. Did I really just hear a guy say the F word in line for Buzz Lightyear? Be, you know, how uncouth, man. Oh, purpose, oh, ladies and gentlemen. One of the th- <laughs> I love that line. Real quick, one of the things I was going to say earlier, the Randy Moore, Mandy Moore bit. I love how well the music from Tangled fits over that scene. That shouldn't, like, it took me, I think, three times watching it before I realized, oh, right, this is not music that was just here. Tony had to decide to put this music here. At one point, I considered shooting the entire review in black and white until I got to Disneyland, kind of a Wizard of Oz thing. But then this joke right here wouldn't have worked, where I cut to yeah. the color version of, of the Enchanted Tiki Room Fountain, and I didn't want to lose that joke. It was too good, so... <laughs> Yeah, and and we're and we're already at the end of part one here, uh, pretty much. And, yeah, part one blows by. <laughs> yeah, it really does. And and yeah, this this stuff. I love the mattress in the background. It was just wait, 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 this one. I know we shot because yeah, you saw yeah, the yeah, mattress. Yeah. And you were just like, we're filming in front of this, and I was yeah. like, fuck yeah, let's do it. <laughs> 
Now, this song uh, is the end credit song of the movie Happiness, directed by Todd Salons, which I later uh, reference in, in part three. And uh, the singer is Michael Stipe of R.E.M., but it's not an R.E.M. track. It's just a solo Michael Stipe track. And there was never a soundtrack album to this movie, and it never got released on a, any compilation or anything. So the bots didn't detect it. Which was nice. So that was, uh, which I can't say for... So how did you get the song? Did you rip it from the DVD? I just DVD? ripped it from the DVD, okay. yeah. So there, there you go. And, and by the way, Happiness is a really great movie... Uh, that kind of does this concept right of, of everyone's just a miserable horrible person. I specifically haven't watched it because from what I've heard it's just too intense for me. It is pretty intense but I personally think it's really I've well done. I've heard it's done. phenomenal. It's just I've heard the subject matter and it's too intense for me. Yeah it, it, it is a little too it, it is a little intense. I don't I don't blame you but it's uh, but if you can handle it it's a really good movie so just one last comment. I love how pouty Charlie is during the support scene. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was a nice detail. They decided to create this backstory that Haley was dragging Charlie to the meeting and he really didn't want to go. And of course, a complicated song by Weird Al, the verse about him getting his head torn off on a roller coaster. Had to, how does had to that work, fit? Had to work that in somewhere. Well, I don't know. Previously on the Ben Stiller show. Okay, so uh, now earlier, after I mentioned the Ben Stiller thing, uh, the music I played over it was the theme from the Ben Stiller show. Basically, in 1992, Ben Stiller had a show on a sketch show on Fox for 13 episodes, which was one of the best things on TV at the time. It was way ahead of its time. Co-created by Judd Apatow. Co-created by Judd Apatow, starring Bob Odenkirk and Janine Garofalo and Andy Dick, and uh, and that and that clip of him as Oliver Stone. Uh, uh, was from the Ben Stiller show and of course uh, shot in a famous part of the Warner Brothers lot basically the Warner's equivalent of Hill Valley yeah exactly and this bit from from 30 Rock coming up it was from one of the last episodes where finally Liz Lemon just comes out and says you know I am attractive which which I love that moment in 30 Rock because up to that point they had always you know made jokes about Liz Lemon somehow being unattractive and it's like which no, nobody it, bought yeah, yeah. no I, I certainly didn't buy it so for her to find Finally, come out and say that. It's like, yes, thank you. You know, as good a time as any to discuss the excessive green screen in Escape. From yeah, Tomorrow. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't Which, think you use as much green screen in this review <laughs> as they use in Escape from Tomorrow. Now, Probably not. That would be forgivable to me, were it not for the fact that the entire central gimmick of this fucking movie is the fact that they shot on location. I honestly, if, if this movie had anything else going for it, I could forgive the green screen scenes. I honest to God think if you cut down everything that was green screened or not shot on location or doesn't have dialogue. And I just that one green motorcycle that just runs by. I, we, lucked the, we lucked the hell into that. We really did. That was not planned whatsoever. And that was just the one take where we didn't have any other cars and it just seemed like, you know, yeah, why not? But I seriously green think motorcycle. if you took just the footage of Escape from Tomorrow with dialogue shot in the park, the film would be like 15 minutes long. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Honest to God, the stuff that's Maybe so 20. goddamn impressive, you could shoot in. We could shoot in a day. Like I listened to the commentary. This was not shot in the park. Of course, this it was wasn't. shot in in some local in some local park in Los Angeles, also, and it was not. I always thought the wheelchair guy there, or the scooter guy, I always thought his voice sounded so much like uh, Stephen Root as Gideon's dad on Gravity Falls. <laughs> it does. Oh kinda. my God! <laughs> Similar accent, definitely. Kind of bumped into each other, Stanford. <laughs> By the way, the nurse is my favorite character in the she movie. She's so good. She, uh, the actress, especially. That's is what just, I mean. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but she's the only one who actually seems to. Well, well, not the only one who gives a shit. But certainly, you know, some. I I think some people in the comments, you know, commented on like real nurses don't dress like that anymore. That's like a nurse in World War II outfit. And it's like I don't care. She's actually playing a character that I kind of care about. Her oh, her performance. The word Walt Disney World on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that uh, totally a Disney World nurses off. Oh, and this is a uh, Tim Christ, aka Shoebox of the band Worm Quartet. He was uh, visiting L.A. with his wife and son, and uh, we ate at Cantor's one evening and shot that one shot. And he was, yeah, he's a great guy. Go seek out his music, Worm Quartet. Really great stuff. Really, the thing about the nurse though is the fact that she's the most human of all the characters. Mm -hmm. The stuff she's talking about and the way she reacts to it. Those are human reactions. Like, maybe they're a little played up, but if you've been watching adults and kids die to a mysterious cat flu, you'd be a little emotionally fucked up, too. Yeah, like, exactly. 
Okay, this was shot in uh, the park right ne- uh, right across the street from the Grove in L.A. And uh, the, and uh, it, it took us a while to get through this just because it's such a long speech. And, well, it and has at, to... at first, I don't think I was framing it right. The first right, couple right, takes, right, right. I didn't get the split screen thing. And then after like... Well, I didn't. I, I, I eventually altered it for the split screen. Okay. I, I, I digitally fixed it for um, in post for the split screen. But, but I, I, I do think there was some sort of problem. I don't remember what it was. But I, I do know getting the timing of this was was kind of a challenge, and getting getting all the way through it and making the whole thing sound naturalistic was a bit of a challenge. But we did it eventually. Yeah. Well, because because it, especially with the. The last sentence, which is just a string of words, but it has to sound like you're saying a sentence for the joke to work, that's not easy to do. That's like, that sounds easier than it is. Now, as long as we're nitpicking about the film's portrayal of park layouts, yes. here they are sitting on a bench in front of the Finding Nemo submarine lagoon while they're facing Toontown. Yep. Not only are those two things nowhere near each other, they're also both not in Florida. Right. To be fair, hybrid. Yeah, and... Really shitty hybrid. <laughs> and, the, and it's clearly green screen. By the way, I went to an opening night uh, Q&A screening of Escape from Tomorrow. That's how I saw it for the first time. And uh, the, and they said the director would be there. He was not. He chickened out apparently. But the guy who played Jim was there, which is how I got that bit at, toward in part three of him saying you're watching some jerk with a camera. And the woman who played Emu Woman was there, and she confessed that she did not set foot onto the park. All, all of the scenes with her were shot uh, somewhere else, not not on the. I could have sworn that sex scene was shot on location in the <laughs> yeah, park. Yeah, that was in Mr. Toad's Wild Ride specifically. <laughs> well, it was hell. And this emu bit, uh, it's basically my attempt at, like, a comedy bit that Paul F. Tompkins might do. It's it, it's me, like, you know, taking this completely ridiculous, absurd conceit and just breaking it down logically until it is demolished. And appropriately enough, you use a Paul F. Tompkins song. I do, yeah, la- la- later on, but we'll talk about that. I think this was the last bit we shot that day, because this was the same day as the Jenny McCarthy Yeah, bit. it was. Yeah, yeah this and is it, the same park. It, it's, it's, like, uh, literally... A hundred feet away, or something. Right, from exactly. Where we shot that bit, and that, and uh, that, and then the the bit on the bench a little later, but mm-hmm. um, where I'm saying, you know, you don't seem to have much trouble shoving lies down people's throats. Yes. Now here, where I finally go crazy and say, you know, you ever seen eight emus? My one regret is I wish I had done more with my eyes. Because I feel like, you know, my, the rest of me is angry enough, but I, I should have gone, like, more bug-eyed in, uh, in this and, and, and really played that up. At, at this point, it feels like it's a little too much of me pretending to be angry well, and not really angry. To be fair, this was also, like, the fourth take, and it was yeah, the end of a day. That is true. So. That is true. The, um, I, I was happy that you used the, the emu plantation line, which I, I pitched after. Yeah, one yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that I worked in jive turkeys <laughs> and, <laughs> and crow as a turkey from an MST3K Thanksgiving thing. And uh, this is my favorite point you make about <laughs> how many exist in the wild versus how many you're claiming yeah. they're breeding. <laughs> well, and a lot of people commented, it's like, dude, do you know how huge emu legs are? There's no way that could be a turkey leg. It's like, that's the more obvious way to, to you know. And also, people criticized me for pronouncing it emu when it's apparently really pronounced emu. But it's like, dude, the movie pronounces it emu, so that's what I'm doing. Yeah, that's Sorry. you eating the movie on its own terms. That's me being a dumb American. Basically, um, so is the N or is the M supposed to have a tilde on it, like an no, the, 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 like the U is supp- the, 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 the letter U is supposed to be it's pronounced U instead of U. Okay. It's e- emu as opposposed to emu. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Did not know that. And I do like this point that the guy's basically just you know criticizing Disneyland for what he's already doing. The difference is he's not popular. So. <laughs> It's jealousy. Well, it, it's things like so. I actually had heard the emu leg uh, urban legend. Oh yeah, we all have. We, out. we all have. This ju- guy just accepted it as fact. It's it's really. But the dumb. other things like the thing about the princesses being prostitutes. That's a conclusion you can only come to if you don't live anywhere near a Disney park and don't know tons of people well, who have worked at. Disney. Oh yeah. It's also yeah, yeah, the, yeah. If the goal was just to create a like thriller. On, like dark drama set at Disneyland and not to quote unquote expose the truth about Disneyland then that's an interesting concept you could maybe do stuff with like mm-hmm. oh yeah it, 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 it can work there is potential fiction. there but well, I again, don't think he was trying to expose the truth necessarily no, but, I, but, but I mean with, when his whole goal is like you know fuck Disneyland it's so fake 
it, on that's really the attitude that that makes it necessary for him to be more real than Disneyland, as you point out, right, which he's not right, doing. Right, right. If the goal was just hey, Disneyland's a great you know place to set a dark thriller drama because Disneyland is so forced happy. Yeah. Then I'd be like, sure, yeah, make up shit. That's you know that's how films work. Yeah. To, to, to be clear, I don't think Randy Moore really believes that they're actually prostitutes, but to steer into that, like it's fine for fiction, but if that's your criticism of the fakeness of Disney, then the the metaphor know, the, doesn't quite track. The problem is, the, you know, based on just the movie and not you know hearing him talk in interviews, it really doesn't seem like he even has much of an opinion on the Disney parks. Yeah, it's, it's like there was no. I love the evil woman, yeah. you know, ELO st- uh, tag right there. Sorry, I'm 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 saying how proud I am of my own work because pride goeth before a fall. It's a commentary. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. But the, uh, but yeah, it, it just, you don't get a sense of what the filmmaker thinks of Disney World in general. You don't get a sense of why was this shot here in the first place? What are you trying to say? Okay, I have to say about, the, about that speech that we, we just saw, it, I, the th- one of the things I love about this review is by framing it as you hating Disneyland and by framing it as you wanting to be on the movie's side, mm-hmm. you really give the movie every benefit of the doubt humanly possible beyond reason. Which so is so when your character winds up hating the film, it's all the more powerful and all the more of an indictment of the film. Yeah, and and that's how I felt going into it. I really wanted to like this film when I first saw it. I wanted to be a champion of it and and kind of a cheerleader of it. And because because I was shooting on on location at the parks too, and I wanted to encourage this kind of film you know to to uh, to do well and 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 really be a success and it just was it just squandered every last ounce of goodwill i was willing to give it so the pool scene was, i love the timer you know yes, conceit yeah. in this it's it's very good very good. and literally it's like the the only molecule of a thing that happens in this scene is that the wife sees him going up to the, you know, flirting with the French girls, but she saw that earlier! She saw that earlier on the monorail that he that he had his eye on the on the French girls. And- when, when, when we were watching this uh, the first time, I was sort of half-live tweeting it. Um, one of the observations I made at the time was uh, at the end of the scene, the way she gets them out is we need to leave now if we want to get to Epcot in time for the fireworks. And then later it cuts to them wasting like six hours at yeah, Epcot. Yeah, exactly. Having plenty of time. So, so I like tweeted, you know, cut to them spending six hours at Epcot. And a buddy of mine, James Conner, tweeted at me, okay, this is where I draw the line. It's impossible to spend that much time at Epcot. <laughs> oh, this Emily Dickinson bit shot in front of the Writers Guild in Los Angeles. Ah, little perfect. little inside joke there, which is, which is also right near the Grove on 3rd and Fairfax. Pointless fucking argument like the ones they've already had. Also, how the fuck do you confuse Dumbo and Minnie Mouse? Like, if he got oh. Minnie Mouse and she wanted Dumbo, I'd be like, oh, because he wasn't paying attention and he assumed all women want Minnie Mouse. Yeah. But I get that they're like, oh, you gave me Dumbo because it's an elephant? You think I'm an elephant? Go fuck yourself. Like... Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, it, it, it's just the clunkiest still, way of being it's a the bad way, husband. Yeah, but, but also that she, she won't accept a nice gift when he gives it to... It's like, that's yeah. why I worked in... Oh, you know, all right, Veruca, all right. I mean, uh, it's it's a bad movie. It's like every character is just shorthand for being a bad version of whatever character. Yeah, exactly, they are. exactly. Well, the, the only you, you don't really touch on this much in the review itself, but like the only character portrayed remotely positively is the daughter. The son, there's the, like this, there's this sort of running Oedipal thing you don't touch on much, where the son keeps locking the father out. Yeah. Uh, and then climbing into bed with the mother. Which, I forgot about that. Yeah, it, yeah that, it, it, it's the Oedipal running theme in the movie. Oh, Sunset Boulevard. It, we we had to work hard to get that angle. Yeah, that, to see the sign. I feel like was it like a sunset or something, and the the light was weird. Some, it, it was some weird thing, or, or, or like or like it, if you'd gone to this certain angle, you you couldn't because maybe there was construction. Was that or like something, lifting or? it above? I just remember the so, camera I, being. I do remember we had to get a really weird angle to get the Sunset Boulevard sign in the background. I mean, and it, it looks. It, great. Like it, it's, it's very touch and go. I just remember when we were doing it, I was like, why is this hard? This should not be a hard Yeah, exactly, shot. exactly. A- anyway, just my only... The con- chair was made of knives. Yes. <laughs> good good foreshadowing. And, yeah, the fo- foreshadowing the, the end, of course. And uh, the only thing about the Oedipal thing in the movie is it touches on it so little, like, 
It wanted to have an Oedipal element because that makes movies deep, but not yeah, because it of actually course. needed to include and the, and the daughter is, is painted remotely positively because she has no character traits, yeah. essentially, other uh, than she... Other than she's a little girl. Of course, you have to react to the Spaceship Earth gag in front of this. The Cinerama Dome, which basically looks like Spaceship Hemisphere, so. That was my first thought when, the first time I saw a movie there, you're like, yeah, we're seeing it at, you know, the Dome, and I went, I was like, holy shit, this is yeah. like. It's Spaceship Earth, yeah. but, but half of it, but half of it is in the Earth, I guess. I remember hearing Randy Moore talked about how, like, nervous he was when Roy Abramson was doing this scene. Yeah. And, like, acting all drunk and started doing, like, Nazi salutes yeah, and Hitler stuff. Jokes and, and he was and like, stuff. no, we're gonna get kicked out. Now, let me tell you, when I lived in Florida, I would often talk to the uh, cast members at World Showcase, and the cast members in the Germany Pavilion would tell me that at least five times a day, people would, like, do step and Yeah, play. and, and like, hile and, you know. And, and, like, yeah, it's a shitty thing to do, but it's not like they would have been... I mentioned it once, it. but I think I got away with it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Don't mention the war. <laughs> okay, the, 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 the princesses. Why would my... these three princesses be together, and why would Ariel be standing when she's a mermaid? <laughs> Uh, okay, park nitpicking out of the way now. Yeah, and and we I mentioned the uh, the auction scene in Pirates, which is going away, and I I am gonna do a state of the parks on that. So watch out for that pretty soon. And this speech right here was kind of co-written by Haley because I asked her for her um, art expert analysis on uh, Pirates and its connection to feminism or lack thereof. Small world scene from earlier? Well, now it's time for that scene's non-union Mexican... Here's the one bit of cleverness that I will give them credit for, is licensing the song that Three Caballeros is based on. Because yeah. Until I looked into that, I didn't realize it was based on another song. Amoeba Music, my former place of employment until a few years ago. He's and blow-drying a sock. Yeah, because he got blood all over it and stuff. Oh, the blood. I yeah, thought I had to do yeah, the yeah. vomit. I'm like, that's weird that he hit the sock. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, oh it's pretty God, stupid. Yeah, and, and why does the girl's face turn into the fucking Joker? I don't... It's it's so dumb. Well, it's like, those are the things where, if properly handled, they don't need to make sense in a thriller. Like, no, if you not could, necessarily, if you but... you could orchestrate them in a way... Like, like The Shining. But there's no makes, reason... Okay, but there's no reason to care here. No, I know, I know. But that's what I'm saying... What he's clearly going for is something like The Shining that makes no goddamn sense, but is terrifying, so you don't care. You're like, wow, that was a great horror film. Except, it's not scary. It's also, I think this movie is, like, it takes itself too seriously to be funny, but it's too goofy to be terrifying. Because, like, you, we get to it later, but they do a fucking intermission gag, like, nothing yeah, gets into the movie. Where I, li where I literally play the Holy Grail music. Really They're literally just stealing that gag from Holy Grail. Pretty much. Or help. Oh, yeah, or yeah. help, yeah. And, and, yeah I guess Holy Grail stole it from help when you think about it. <laughs> I did not think about that. Yeah. You know what? I don't like cameras This is where Dave takes over as, yeah. as camera guy. Yeah. So, so Nick, that's, that's it for you. Most of my stuff was in the first uh, two. Yeah, well, arc. most of your stuff was in, it was in two and at the very end of one, so. Uh, yeah, because well, I know in one, like, I shot the, the bit in front of the love mural. And right, the, uh, right, right. And, and from everything the from the love that neighborhood with, like, the mattress and, like, the mailbox. And, but, like, yes, this is me hitting you with your home camera. Yeah, and, and there was one take where a dog started barking at us, yeah. and that will be seen eventually on the season three outtake special which I'm still working on. Also also, I didn't mention like it, it last time, but I do love the black and white to be continued. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and here's Paul F. Tompkins improvising emu attack on uh, an episode of Wits. And I believe I told you about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I mentioned the that I was going to do this emu thing, uh, he, he pointed out, well, you know, Paul F. Tompkins improvised this song and then someone on YouTube made music to it. And it was, yeah, it was just absolutely perfect. Emu attack, look it up. So damn cashy. Indeed, indeed. Which is how you get away with the second end credits not getting not zinged getting for copyright. Yeah, right, exactly. Because it's, exactly. just... it's just based on... Yeah, we're, we're all building to, um, you know, the story about getting uh, copyright bots attacking the third part of this. Also, you straight up could do a podcast just called Some Jerk Without a Camera. You know, I've considered it. I, I, I have honestly considered But the problem is, I'm so bad normally at just speaking without a script that, you know, I, I know that I would stutter over my words like I'm kind of doing here sometimes, and I would want to edit it more, and I just don't have time to edit that as well as, you know, my videos. But maybe someday, maybe someday if I learn how to talk. 
State Penitentiary. Also, we haven't addressed this, but I love the running gag of how long has this movie been going so yeah. far. <laughs> like, every time it cuts back to it, it's just like, son of a bitch! This, this is one of your best examples of doing a joke on top of a pop culture record. Yeah, like, yeah. To, to, it literally escaped from tomorrow, and this the music fits together so well. The, like, with the with the doodly doo 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 that of the of Recontextualizing two pop culture references yeah. into a new joke. That's, really that's definitely well. California, Soren. <laughs> yeah, but, oh my god. But that's neither. <laughs> It's like, but why, why, why does the, why does the naked lady appear on Soren? It just, I, I don't get it. I don't, I, what are you trying to say here? What are you, I, and, and, you know, the stuff with Sinekyle was kind of my way of getting out those demons and making it, you know, in Charlie's its own head. way. That, that, that expression Charlie has <laughs> is like your reaction to the scene is like, yeah, what? exactly. <laughs> And and the whole point of Sinekyle really was was me just saying, look, this stuff is its own formula too. You know, it, it's not as deep as you think it is. It can be figured out with an algebraic equation if need be. You know, it, it's like it's like this artsy stuff in its own way is also is just as formulaic as any you know studio project. And this was my way of, of pointing that out. We uh. My my apartment, we used to watch The Room and, like, drink. And there was one night where I, I said, Tonight, I am going to interpret this film as a film student. <laughs> and my roommate, my roommate Aaron Cipollina, who's also a film student, like a film guy, told me later, that was the night I realized how much of film analysis is bullshit. Yeah, exactly. Like, I didn't realize until hearing you prescribe meaning to The Room. And I was like... Shit, that sounds like stuff we're learning in class. And you know, and and look, that's all well and good if you can make it work. If it all actually fits together. The problem is in this film, it doesn't. It's just a bunch of random gobbledygook. And and, and you know, and and you know, I talk about well, why does this happen? Why does that? That's not antithetical. Like I know what it means, but what does what it mean mean? You, right. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Like. It's like, I mean, like, you could have a string of sentences in a paragraph that are unrelated, and it's like, no, I understand what each sentence means, but why the fuck are they in this it's, paragraph It's like Kyle together? says later, I, I'm speaking English, and that should explain everything. I've realized, actually, possibly, for people who aren't sold on that description, another way to word it is if someone's like, I don't understand what you're saying. It's like, well, yeah, that's because I'm talking German. It's like, no, asshole, I speak German, and I still don't understand what you're saying. And here's the elephant eating my head, which is which is nice framing. Uh, th this is basically, we just went to an area of L.A. that was that was just kind of in between the two places where I needed to be for the sake of a joke, and we just kind of winged it as far as where we were. Just kind of found the most interesting background. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly. This and, I, and I remember up. originally we were going to shoot it in a different place, but there was a homeless guy on a bench who kept yelling at us, yeah, remember? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Especially at the anal beads line, whenever I would get to that point, he kept yelling, You can't do that! You can't shove things up your ass! Finally, I was just like, fuck this, let's shoot this somewhere else. This coming scene. Yeah. This is the scene the film should have been built around. Yeah. Like, and it, it, if you took, there are like four or five scenes in this movie that if you scrapped everything else and just took those scenes and said, okay, how do we develop these to make the thriller horror film we want to make? There might have been something interesting in there. Yep. Like, like, the, like the stuff with the the witch who used to be one of the right, right. princesses who apparently are prostitutes. Like, you take that thread, you take this thread, and like, if if you th then a couple other scenes that like could in theory work, but in practice don't. What does any of it mean? It's just it's it's how does any of it connect? To, and and this is just where. I, I decide, yeah, I'm not I'm not even following this anymore. It's like who who this this would break the machine designed to to fix. It, it's like I say in the review, you know. I know you want to keep me guessing, but I have zero incentive to guess. Yeah, we're just yeah. We're, we're just venting about this movie. It, at honestly, this point. it reminds me a little of the the comic strip page in the campus newspaper at UConn. There was there was one comic strip that was actually <laughs> funny. But it, sure, no, but it, it was all these you know it was all students submitted content. And the joke of all of the comic strips was trying to be, no, it's just random, so it's funny. The problem is when you read them all in a row, there's no establishment of normality for the random to violate. So yeah. when you're reading it, you're just like, this all sucks. There's nothing here at all. 
You know, it, you except know for the, actually, the one comic strip and everyone who went to UConn during and you know 2007. Who actually does, talking about. Uh, you know who actually does that really well is Worm Quartet, the, the guy who cameoed in part two. His music, a lot of it is just these strings of absolute nonsense, but it's funny and it's it's really well written nonsense and it and it works on that level. This is not that. Huh. We make the posters with little girls reaching for your junk. Then you have to wear purity rings or else the company looks bad. I also love the, this use of the South Park clip here. Yeah, the, the South Park clip. Uh, at one point I was going to use a Simpsons clip of them saying Disney California Adventure, but ultimately I decided the Disney Sember logo and the Saving Mr. Banks were the other two, you know, escalations I needed to, I needed to get here. I also, I, I love that the one time Gary the Gorilla Gorilla cannot justify what's going on, he exits from the opposite side of the screen. Which was not intentional. I think that the thing was, we tried shooting me on the right side of the screen, and when we shot the close-up of my face, I was backlit or something. Yeah, so we had to shoot it the other way. Yeah, we had to shoot it the other way. And also, with all the Gary shots, the camera has to be on a solid surface, and we didn't bring a tripod. So, so yeah, that, that was, it, it was a lot of touch and go, a lot of improvisation there. I, I believe we deliberately avoided bringing your tripod just so we wouldn't draw too much attention to ourselves. Exactly. The and the Kevin Spacey thing, which has not aged well, unfortunately. But, but like, this eh, is one of those scenes do? that visually... Like, this is the scene that they obviously hired the production designers for. It's yeah, shit like of this. Course, of course. But the... I mean, which makes the joke no less funny. Right, and I, right, can I argue right. that that joke is still fucking hilarious, and you absolutely had to do it. Mm-hmm. But... Also, David, you brought up a point about this costume. Yeah, so she, like, earlier we saw very specific Disney princesses that we recognize, but apparently this woman just played Princess Princess. She probably didn't even work at Disneyland. She just thought she did. She worked at, like, one of those, like... She was always a crazy woman who wandered in. Green screened over footage shot on the monorail at Epcot. Yeah, so. What is supposed to be happening here? I mean, it's supposed uh, to be stylistic chaos, but... Again, this is the one green screen scene where it's like, okay, so this is not supposed to be where she actually is. But all the other green screen scenes... Uh, Speaking of things that don't age well... (laughs) uh, Aside from the fact that uh, it's bullshit that there's so much green screen in a movie whose entire selling point is shot on location, the green screen scenes are all also really weirdly framed. Right, yeah. And really badly lit. And really badly lit. Like, you would think this... By the way, this is true. There is a prominent porn star named Randy Moore who happens to share a name with the director of Escape from Tomorrow. And she's actually here tonight, so... Yeah, uh, oh, there we go. No. Uh, She can't speak. She's unfortunately mute. Yep, um, and uh, didn't the, think this through. But 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 you would think that the scenes that they shot at their own studio would be the scenes they could have more control over the framing and lighting. Of. But Randy Moore didn't know what the hell he was doing, so, so like, you know, it's like this scene is such an anticlimax here. Like you're talking yeah. about, she breaks the thing, no one cares. Like this could have been a really interesting climax, just aesthetically. If the if one they had caused us to invest emotionally. If two, they had made the threat feel real, and three, if anything had fucking happened in the scene. Again, it was the scene they were building to with the Snow White ride scene with the witches aren't real, and it's nothing. And by the way, that that line, late stage pretentia, uh, Chris Karen, who we saw earlier saying, I thought it was a filk circle, uh, came up with that. So thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, Um, that that was... The moment he came up with that, we were like, that is fucking brilliant. You know, we're dissing on uh, on Randy Moore a lot, and deservedly so, but the thing is, honestly, at the end of the day, I do have respect for him in the sense that he actually went and did it. I mean, I mean, a lot of us, you know, we talk about, you know, oh, if, if I was to shoot a film at, at, on location at the Disney parks, I'd do it totally different. Well, fact is, we're just shooting our, you know, our dumb web series. He's the one who actually went and shot kind of a movie. <laughs> a you know, movie. At, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, st- it got theatrical distribution, I'll give it that much. You know, technically, technically, it was 90 minutes long, and it and it was shot in HD and all that, so, you know, and I, I mean, it looks enough like a, it looks passably enough like a real you movie. You could easily confuse it for a movie. Yes. And holy shit, ch- like, even in this little thing, you know, that, that I just, I just put my camera in front of him and say, hey, could you do the thing, you know, at the, pr-? because I thought I would be putting that in my one or I wasn't calling it one movie later at that point but in my vlog about Escape from Tomorrow that I released at the time 
Um, but ultimately, when I was editing, I was like, I don't have positive enough opinions of this movie. And speaking of that screening, this is the one joke I thought of while I was watching it for the first time, is when he has those cat eyes, I was like, okay, I have to reference the thriller video. I just have to say, though, the framing the use of the, you know, plug for your show. And the guy who looks like Willem Dafoe, who, of course, was later in The Florida Project, which is a much better movie about... And it's a testament to how little impact this movie made that I've seen lots of articles about the last scene of Florida Project. Not a single one of them even so much as mentioned. Previously, there was another movie that... Yeah, yeah exactly, Disney World. exactly. So, I'm sorry, Nick, oh, yeah. what were no, you... I was just going to say, I love the framing device of too bad I'll never get to use that clip. Yeah. <laughs> because it, I mean, it honestly, it's too good of a clip not to use, but at the same time, you don't want to be using a clip of him promoting your thing while bashing his thing. Yeah, exactly. So, so framing so it as, it he's like such that. a nice guy, he did this for me, which is not appropriate for me to use. Is like, yeah. I mean, it's sort of like, I'm going to slip it under the radar, but it's also just legit, like... No, he's a nice dude. And like, it's also, you know, the irony of I just used yeah. it and I say I can't. Right, no, use exactly. It, so. And but also And the faulty that, towers, of course, you gotta have Even in that video clip, that actor was giving it his all. Yeah. He was doing the cheesy like, hey, I'm doing a promo thing yeah, until exactly. the lawyers found out about it, like yeah, it, it just and this was and this was based on Nick what you said about uh, 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 about how nothing in the movie is none of the bad stuff is Disney's fault everything. As I recall, the way you phrased it when we were watching the film was, "I'm having trouble seeing how Disney is the antagonist or how there is a protagonist." <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, now now there's a shot coming at when it gets to the princesses, but but yeah, um, there's a shot in the pro- which I just recently noticed where. The princess in the middle reacts as though right one here. of the businessmen has grabbed her ass, but everyone's hands are somewhere else. No one's hands are in a position where they could have grabbed her ass. I'll, I'll point it out when it when it comes. Like right like, after this it's shot, right? It's right there. Yeah. Who is grabbing her ass? She's right grabbing there? her ass. She, you a, see her grab her ass. No what, one else grabs her ass. Is she schizophrenic? What happened there? It's like oh, maybe it's God. a really delayed reaction. Like three seconds ago, I someone guess. pinched her ass. Oh. And she only just now noticed. Uh, yeah. Then and then prostitution's the least of her worries. I get it. it's, but yeah, um, this was all taken. Yeah. The other thing they could have done with the prostitution, if it. Oh, by the way, that shot of the of the of the of the, uh, of the fat guy, uh, you know, dancing to "It's a Small World." That was when Charlie rage quit. I brought, I brought this movie to a movie night, and we got like five minutes into it, and then that shot of that guy dancing to "It's a Small World," and Charlie's like, "No, fuck this. I'm not. Wa- we're not watching this anymore." I love rage quit moments. It's always interesting to see what what. About, I'm off. sorry, you were saying. Oh, uh, I was say the other. Th- I mean, like. With the prostitution, if you're trying to make a thematic point or drawing a connection where, yeah, no, they're not literally asking people to prostitute themselves, but it's the same kind of degrading, low pay, like, there potentially you could have been exaggerating a true aspect of working at Disney World in a way to make a point. But they don't but they get don't into do it. it. Like, they don't do it. They don't get into that at all. Like, if that's what you were doing, then that's an example of not saying something that's explicitly true, but thematically tapping into something that's true in an artistic way. This movie right. could have been 50 times better if it just chose one of its themes and stuck with it. Yeah. And here's the and here's the other thing. Also, can you read that the end? <laughs> Why pick white with black shading and, and I, a black and, and white? And that was the other thing I knew as early as this Magfest footage was I knew I wanted it to end with him saying I got nothing and just and just go to that. Um but you know we were talking about this earlier Nick you pointed out, you know, the worst thing Disney does is sexualize the princesses when every female character in this movie is either sexualized or some sort of reaction to sexualization. Minus this girl right Minus here. This little we, girl. We realized at the last moment that girl is not sexualized. And, but, and, and she's not the same little girl that Jim had in the rest of the movie. But, you know, like... But, like, but literally, this actress that we just saw, she, she was topless and The sword. wife right here doesn't want to you know, react sexually to stuff. And, and she's, she's treated as the bad guy exactly, for that. she's demonized for it. The little girl even has that creepy scene in the bed of flowers yeah. in a princess costume. And, the, and of course, the, the emo woman, he has sex with her. The nurse, he looks at her cleavage. And, of course, the French girl. 
girls he fucking right. chases around One of all whom the time. was straight up 13, they mentioned in a behind-the-scenes thing. And the crazy thing is, I realized, this is almost a f- an all-female cast, except for Jim. Like, the, like there's Damn, Jim, there's Jim yeah. and his son, and then it's the rest of the supporting cast, and the guy in the wheelchair. And the doctor, and, the, the scientist guy. Oh, yeah, and the scientist guy. And, and, he's uh, a robot, but he doesn't he's a count. robot. Yeah. He, does he have general? I don't know. Okay, so this bit with Trevor... Um, we, we came back a second day to uh, to Santa Monica. Uh, yeah, after part one had already come out and it was posted on Channel Awesome, uh, Trevor uh, Trevor Michael McCune here uh, made a comment saying, "Yeah, I was in this movie. I played the bellhop." And like, wow! And I uh, we we exchanged info, and I said, "Would you like to be in part three? I'm still working on it." And so, and he and we put it all together, and we worked out that it would be this like JFK parody where where he was like playing the Donald Sutherland character. So finally, your uh, status quo of taking forever to finish videos has yeah, paid off. it paid off, damn it. It was... This review would have been great anyway, but it couldn't have been as perfect as it is without this bit because suddenly he's like, the reason we put that DVD at Universal yeah. City, like, Which was a completely, la- I wasn't planning that from the first time when, when I did that it bit in the Shrek video. It things look so much more intentional than they were <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a, and, and, and it was just something that occurred to me that, oh, I can tie this in to, so the, to how I ended the Shrek. Sir. Yeah, exactly. It, it was but a, it's not even a retcon because there was no established canon. And and Trevor was so excited to do this. He he prepared his own wardrobe for the day. He said, "I want to wear a trench coat like like Donald Sutherland he wears was, in JFK." I love the shit out of his wardrobe, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he, and he, he was super cool. He was super friendly. He was he was a great great guy. Great to shoot with. Great Very to work with. To be there. Just just really just really altogether wonderful. I also and, uh, I love that in the movie he's like they got this clean shaven boyish look, and here mm-hmm. he's got this grizzled yeah. like five o'clock shadow look where it's like I've seen shit, man. I'm been on the other side. I think he even I, and I, I I don't think he could have shaved. I, I think he was doing something else where where he had to keep the, the stubble for some reason or he was growing up. Be- I, I don't remember exactly what. It, there was some sort of issue with it but ultimately I decided like no I'm I, I definitely it looks better when you've got the stubble. So and 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 this hat the, and this uh <laughs> <laughs> this funny, I, well, this which, so which, I, I had it because it lo- um, it was a hat I already had for some reason or another, and uh, and it looked a lot like the hat he was wearing in the movie, so that was the intended reference there. I just love but, throwing the jacket over the yeah, his back and, like that. It, and, and, and going about into this soft scene, focus, and and of course Gary shows up again. Now, I, 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 yeah, sometimes I wonder if I should have just chosen Cynical or Gary, but no, nah, they serve two different functions. Yeah. So. No, exactly. They they because one is about the content and the other's about the production. Mm-hmm. Like Gar- Gary's about the guerrilla production aspect right, and Cynical's right. about what the genre means. and team. One's about how it was uh, one's about the how, the other's about the why. Exactly. Yeah. So and and this was uh, th- this took us forever to shoot because my hair kept blowing up and looking weird. It was a weird. pretty windy day. It was a pretty yeah, windy day and, in Santa Monica. And originally it was me saying that entire line, but uh, but then we needed to cut between something between the Trevor scene and this. So ultimately, I just cut in that shot of the DVD cover against black and it going off into the distance. And this, of course, is a Bill Hicks bit, which I often uh, it, it, it's it's a seminal bit of. Uh, 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 of uh, comedy about movie criticism about oh it's a piece of shit exactly that's all it is I, it's a bit I absolutely it comes to mind a lot when uh, in yeah. in the in the uh, quote unquote career that I am in and this is the bit of which almost for a while was on this movie's Wikipedia page but I, but then someone took it down I guess they decided I wasn't a prominent enough critic or something huh. what that's are you gonna amazing. do. <laughs> I remember for a while there was a big fight with one of the Wikipedia editors and and one of its moderators over whether or not it should be included. And wouldn't you know it, the guy who was fighting against me had eight eight in his username, which meant probably a Nazi because that's one of their that's one of their dog whistles, of course. So that's that's nice. I remember at one point he said, you know, I appreciate that you started this page, but by including this quote, you have raped it. It's like, well. 
I don't need to apologize anymore for the It's a Small World episode. I feel like you shouldn't appreciate starting no. the page. And Kyle has never looked creepier. And this was literally just, I found out about the postmodern quote, and, I, and it pissed me off, but I didn't quite know enough about postmodernism to properly articulate why, and I just sent Kyle this message basically just picking his brain about it, and he said, yeah, that's complete horseshit. And he wrote this rant, which is almost word for word what ended up in the episode, and I just said, that's brilliant, Kyle, just film yourself in the closet just mouthing more words, and I'll edit it in and make it work. It's lucky you ended that yeah. clip with shoving him in the closet there. Yeah, I didn't exactly. realize that was unplanned. Exactly, yeah, that, that exactly. I was going with later. Postmodern non-sequitur zippity-da-da. Zippity-da-da. I am way too proud of that line. Yeah. Oh, and earlier, I forgot to mention this, but earlier when Kyle is uh, singing Daisy, Daisy, Give Me Your Answer Do, as a 2001 reference, obviously, uh, originally, w when he was recording that, originally he, uh, with his mouth, tried to do Daisy, Daisy, and I had to ask for a retake. I say, no, just sing it straight, and I'll digitally do that, because otherwise it's not going to sound right, so... That was, and and the voice of Cynikyle, by the way, uh, he asked, what kind of robot do I want it to sound like? And I said, have you ever seen Clone High? Basically, <laughs> like, like make it, just make it sound like Mr. Butler-tron, basically. It's not a Ben Stiller comedy, folks. I, it, but this is back on the first day we shot it. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, we, we shot both of those things. Because it costs money to ride that Ferris wheel, and we didn't want to waste money. A lot money. of money. Yeah, the thing, the, clearly the reason he doesn't want to be associated with a Ben Stiller comedy is he feels that's low brow, and he wants yeah. to be high brow. But like, Ben Stiller has been in Noah Baumbach and Wes right. Anderson movies. But those are Noah Baumbach and, you know, Wes Anderson movies. They're not Ben Stiller movies. They're not defined by the presence of Ben Stiller. Yeah. I mean, when you I, say Ben Stiller comedy, people think Zoolander, Tropic yeah. Thunder. And so in his mind, museum, it's like yeah. a lowbrow form of comedy. I guess. That being said, I fucking love Tropic Thunder. Yeah, it's, like, one, of the, it's one of the best comedies of the last ten years. It, it is pretentious to, to like assume lowbrow means bad. Right, exactly. But I, I, I gotta say, I love your line about this isn't even pretentious. You need ambition to be pretentious. This is fucking inept. Yeah. Like... That is one of the. That's one of the three best criticisms of the film, I think, that you have. <laughs> well, we'll do a big countdown at some yeah. point. I, guess, but I forget if that line passed already because we've been talking a lot. Yeah, so. it passed. But yeah, and, and Inside Out was a better exploration of what it of what depression is than this movie supposedly about depressed people in the happiest place on earth. Like yeah, Inside Out, so. Inside Out was a better meditation on forced happiness, and that was released by Disney. It also had a much better grasp of consistent metaphor. <laughs> Yep, exactly. And this this was shot over uh, in in in, in Santa Monica. You'll know this if you've been there. But there's a bit where you walk down from the cliffs where the Santa Monica Promenade is, and you have to cross over this bridge over the highway. And it's uh, it was a really cool location. I knew I had to use it at some point. To give us something, anything. we should probably talk about the ending uh, uh, because we're not going to have as much time when it actually oh, yeah. comes there. Um, but basically, I always knew that the ending had to be what it is. I always knew I wanted that specific um, that specific thing for an ending. And for a while, I wasn't sure exactly which song I wanted to use. Uh, I just knew I wanted it to be a ballad, and I didn't want it to be about uh, love, God, or home. Because I didn't want to imply that Disneyland was my love, my God, or my home. I wanted it to be a little more obtuse than that. And I kept coming back to this one deep cut on a, on a Robbie Falk's album, on his live album, Revenge called On A Real Good Day, which is, when you first listen to the album, or at least when I first listened to that album, it was kind of just a nothing song. It was kind of like, okay, this is a little slow song, you know, to calm. Oh, and, and here clips from Song of the South and The Sweatbox. For those who don't know, pretty much everyone knows what Song of the South is by this point, but The Sweatbox is a documentary that was made, oh, the fucking match party con. This was, this, okay. this was the other thing we shot on the Trevor Day. Yeah, yeah, thing. exactly. We to come well, back well on the Trevor Day, we shot, we shot this, we shot the stuff with Trevor, obviously, 
And then we got in our respective cars and drove to Disneyland. Uh, and that's when I shot the uh, the dash cam footage on the On a Real Good Day sequence later. And then when we got to Disneyland, we shot a few random shots for the Haunted Mansion review later. And you can tell which shots were shot on that day because you'll notice my top button is missing on my Some Jerk shirt because it tore off somewhere. So in the Haunted Mansion review, look for the shots where that top button is missing and where it's just me and not Jack and Josh. So. And if you point them out in the comments, you win nothing! Yay! So, you know, the, the, the track on a real good day, um, I, I, you know, I, I didn't want to choose that just because it was the first one I thought of. But, uh, by the way, here where I say, you know, thank Heavenly God Almighty that it wasn't a Ben Stiller comedy, maybe I should have gone, done thank Heavenly God Almighty they bleeped the word Disney because that might have been a little more, yeah, yeah, that, that, that might have tied in thematically a little more to me talking about copyrights and third-party content and all that, but... Yeah, it's, uh, but, but anyway, and this, by the way, this bit where Randy Moore is sitting there and the fist comes from off screen and punches him off screen, that's the last joke in the episode. From this point on, it's all just me kind of seriously, earnestly talking about my thoughts on the movie, and that's kind of risky, I, I, I think. I, I was, I was kind of worried. Like, I knew this is how I had to end the review. I had to end it with something... I, I, I had to make the ending of this as beautiful as possible just to compensate for how ugly the movie Escape from Tomorrow is. You know, I had to make this kind of my attempt at, you know, subtly. I didn't want, I want, I didn't want to be overt with it, but of course this commentary gives it away, so whatever. But, you know, I, 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 I felt like in order to, you know, restore balance to the universe, basically, I had to, I had to just go all for broke and make, you know, the artsiest ending that I would conceivably do to this. And it, I knew this is what it had to be. It had to be me getting fed up with his, you know, lemmings going over the cliff uh, thing. And it I, I, ties together your season arc as well. So as yeah. a fictional character, it resonates because this is the story reason why you go back to Disneyland. I, I, I particularly love uh, this speech coming up here because it is both your legitimate analysis of Disneyland and jerk the character's coming to terms with what Disneyland really is yeah, and, and like appreciating it for what it really is and not just the fictional heaven he used to think it was. Yeah, and, and, and in a way that is Disney's fault for advertising itself as just a fictional heaven. You know, advertising itself as, as you know, Universal... Well, because it advertises to the kids. It doesn't advertise to the parents. Exactly. It, Universal gets it right by just saying, here, come here and ride the movies. It's like, that's what... That's what Disneyland always is. And by the way, this new version of it, which I re-uploaded to YouTube because of, um, you know, song issues, which we'll get to, I added something to this montage of other videos shot at the park. I added this Brandon Rogers, Grandpa Hates Disneyland bit, which I was made aware of literally days after I uploaded part three uh, to YouTube. And it just, um, and, and I was like, oh man, I should have, I should have included that. So when I had to redo this, I did. But its content is borderline unwatchable, like a less racist birth of a nation. And that's the tragedy of all this. So this speech, um, real quick on the previous speech you had, yeah. the line I love is when you say this film wasn't impossible. This film was inevitable. Right, right. That's another great point. Because we, we, we all talked about, you know, I feel like every Disney fan or Disney Park fan who gives a crap about movies had that idea at some point. I had it back when I was, you know, a teenager that, hey, you could shoot a movie at the Disney Parks and it could, you could make it work. And you think even always in film, directors have been stealing shots. I yeah. mean, in fucking North by Northwest, Alfred Hitchcock stole a shot of the UN mm -hmm. while the cops were checking his other van. Yep. Like, directors have always been shooting without permission. And the more your technology gets compressed, the easier it is to do that. And by the way, it wasn't intentional when I wrote it, but what, the way we shot it, it worked really well. How, I'm, how the guy's talking about lemmings going off the cliff together when behind me is a cliff. Yeah. It's like this is, it, it, in, a, in a sense, I've kind of... I went over the cliff and I'm fine. I went over the cliff and, and there you go. So, uh, so how bad could it be? Because we know they're fake. That ability to escape to embrace the power of imagination over boring, horrible reality. 
So the song um, was recently, about six months ago, it got the video, uh, the original version of the video blocked from YouTube because, uh, you know, I knew that using the whole song would get it monetized by the, by, by the owners of the music. I was just hoping they wouldn't block it. I had a couple other alternate ideas for songs, but ultimately I just kept coming back to On A Real Good Day because it just seemed so perfect. And the thing about it, I, I haven't seen the other version of it. I've only seen this version. And I love this version so much. I, I'm not not overly interested in seeing the other version because tonally what this song like the the message of this song and the tone of this song just so perfectly and by fits. the way what a beautiful shot I know. this, this it, might be dave's finest hour oh, here I because think, I thank you I, I and mean, I was basically just pointing the camera in the direction you told me to point yeah well, uh, I, well uh, but i think we did oh my god the, the bird, bird the, the bird. fucking bird like I just remember watching this editing room and seeing that bird and just going, okay, Dave, stick the landing, stick the landing, stick the landing. Because a couple of takes, like, the camera went all... And, and this is w w When he turned it around here, on me. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. And thank you very takes, much. There are a couple of takes where I was just straight up slipping off the sandal edge there. Cause, <laughs> yeah. Because that, that was the, kind of a... a this moment here, where you yeah. go to throw it in the sea, and then right here, it's not even worth it. Yeah, I, I remember I, I told this idea to, to my friends and I said, yeah, I'm going to throw the disc into the ocean. And they said, no, you shouldn't throw the disc into the ocean. You should just drop it on the beach it, it's and go. And the, it's the not even worth it. In the third uh, time in the second episode right. of Arrested was... Development that Job tries to throw something <laughs> into the sea and he just drops the rabbit because he's like, fuck it, I'm done. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. But the... Um, but yeah, the use of this song it, it, the, the uh, in the other version that is still on YouTube, you can find this version on Vi on uh, Vimeo uh, right now, and um, and there's a link to it at the actual uh, video on YouTube. But we're talking over the Vimeo version because screw it, we're talking over it. Okay. They're not gonna notice it. But in the version that's still on YouTube, I used a song called Disneyland from a musical called Smile, which was a Broadway flop from 1986 with uh, music by Marvin Hamlish. I love all the words in that sentence. Lyrics <laughs> lyrics by Howard Ashman, and the song Disneyland is performed by Jody Benson. So wow. it's Ariel singing a song written by Howard Ashman uh, you know, about Disneyland itself. And it really, it's a song that really gets to the heart of why, um, of, of why people actually, uh, of the point I make about, you know, we don't go because we think it's real, we go because we know it's fake. And that's kind of the point of the song itself is, you know, you, you tell me it's fake, I'll, I'll turn around and tell you I don't care. And that's a lot more on the nose. And I was actually considering using that song originally, but it felt too on the nose and it felt, re it, 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 and ultimately it ended the video on a triumphant note where I wanted to end it more on a bittersweet note and on a real good day was. And, and I will say having seen, having watched both versions, I really do enjoy the tone set by on a real good day. But there are things I appreciate about the use of the song Disneyland as well. Um, it is more on the nose, but there are also some lines that fit really perfectly. Like there's a lyric about, you know, watching parents fight. There's a lyric about a black and white teeth, like seeing it on the black and white TV. Yeah, yeah. Those all fit this review pretty well. But I think my take overall is tonally, On A Real Good Day is the better finale song for this review. But Disneyland might be the better finale song for the arc as it begins in ABC Goes to Disney. See, here's here's my take on it is the reason I love this song is this song is not about Disneyland. It's about the character of Jerk. Yeah. The reason this song fits is this is about his character arc and where he is, which is why I love this lip syncing bit because which this is, is which is a, which is a reference to uh, Jackie Brown. Which I didn't even put together. Yeah, but uh, it, uh, the end of Jackie Brown, where she lip syncs to Across 110th Street, and I didn't even intend it as as that deep, you know, thing you're reading into it. It was just kind of a Jackie Brown reference. But, but like, but like tonally, what it the, the reason this is like the the Shrek 4D review and this review are my favorite. All is one unit because the Shrek bleeds into this right at the end. Right, right. But I love how narrative and how cinematic this is. Where really, what it's about you going back to Disneyland, but really, it's about you coming to terms with the fact that you're just some jerk with a camera. Yeah. And the fact that the reason you go to Disneyland isn't because it gives your life purpose, but because it accents your life in this, you know, way that is positive. 
Also, we have to quickly talk about this is uh, me on the back of a Main Street uh, horse and carriage. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it, poor man's crane shot, basically. But damn, does it work well. And I, I love that the credits are done, so you get to see it in its full glory. And yeah, this is basically, and we did this a couple times. I just rode to the end of Main Street, then ran back up to the castle, then... Yeah, so I could, and and it works really well. And right here, pretty soon, you know, I I was unsure about this, but ultimately I decided the garbage. Yeah. It was just too per. It's warts and all, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Perfect. It's Disneyland. Thematic encapsulation of everything. Exactly. And, and right at the end, where you become revealed again because the crowd parts. Like you can't pay for that kind of production value. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean that that ending is my favorite part of the review. I mean, I love a lot of stuff about this. It's review. my favorite thing I've ever done. I think we shot that on a day where we were shooting a bunch of stuff for a bunch of people. It was actually um right after I moved here. It it was basically the first weekend I got my annual pass. We also shot a bit for Charlie's uh, Radiator Springs Racers review that day. And, That's right. And a couple other things. You were just asking, okay, who wants to, you know, hold camera for this shot? And I immediately volunteered because you had described the shot to me. And selfishly, you know, I just had a feeling this shot is going to be one of the most memorable moments in some jerk with the camera. And I want to point to it and say, yeah, I'm the dude holding that. <laughs> you, all, I mean, it, it worked out because you also got to do the, the beach scene as we were talking about, which is the other most memorable moment in some with it. And they're right on the heels of each other. This is what I love about this ending is from the moment, like you pointed out, where you stop making jokes, from that moment to the end is where it's like, okay, we've made a lot of jokes. We've talked a lot of shit. Yeah, we have a lot of fun here on this, on some jerk with a camera. Exactly. But. It's like, could we take a moment and just genuinely appreciate what is Disneyland and what is narrative yeah. storytelling and what it means to engage with these things as humans. What does it mean to be happy? What is it like? You take all these themes that are like, hey, I know we're a goofy review show, but if we really want to do justice to Disneyland and to debunking this myth that Disneyland needs to be stopped, quote unquote. And, and to actually engaging with the themes that the movie was only surface level scratching at. Right. It's, it's like we need to address, well, why is your instinct that fake is bad? Why is your instinct that happiness can't be forced? Like, you're right, but there's something deeper going on there. And yeah. forcing happiness, it's not that the goal of being happy when you don't want to be is wrong. It's that Forcing it is the wrong approach. And though I'm not happy, I can pretend on a real good yeah. day. You know, it's like I always knew that this had to be the ending of this review. Like, like as soon as I conceptualize, yeah, it's got to end with me coming back to Disneyland, but it's got to do it in this way. And I can't say a word in the end. It's got to be show, not tell. I always knew that had to be the ending, but I was really worried about how people would react to it. I was worried that maybe I was wrong and it was a little too pretentious of me to end the video like that. And that people would call me out for my pretension and say, what is this shit? And it received almost unanimous praise. Maybe one or two people might have been critical of it, or maybe they were critical of the entire review, but no one came out and defended the movie, by the way. No one said, no, you're wrong about Escape from Tomorrow, because blah, 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 blah. No one defended the movie, and everyone who talked about that ending scene loved it. So... Yeah, I, I guess I made the right choice. I definitely think you did, because part of it is just the fact that you're so cinematic in that moment, which is something Escape from Tomorrow never was. Yeah, like, like I said, I had to respond to how horrible that movie was by producing the best thing I possibly could. And by actually utilizing the resources of the park with the horse and carriage. Yeah, exactly. You think the most cinematic thing they have at the park, as far as I can remember, that's actually shot at the park is that scene of the girls and the guys backlit with the fireworks where they're just standing there. And they use it for, like, way too goddamn long. Because it's pretty. But it's like this static shot that when I saw it in the trailer, I went, oh, that could be cool, that could be interesting. And when I got to that scene in the movie, I'm like, okay, this is nothing. So to instead be like, no, we're going to have a tracking shot where we're riding on the transportation provided and just m taking the time and effort to coordinate it with the movement of the character. But additionally, thematically, the idea that the ending is, like you said, bittersweet. It it's not the magic of Disneyland has been restored. It's like a coming of age thing almost where it's like, here I am now as an adult, not as a child. As and a child, I, was, I believe it's real. And as I was an adult, 32 I when I came <laughs> out. Right. That is one of the things, again, 
why I think the song Disneyland, even if it's not better than uh, On a Real Good Day, it was an acceptable compromise thematically. And by the way, never reissued on CD, so I got it past the box. Yeah. I think why it works as a conclusion to the arc that's set up with the God Song montage, because it has in the lyrics, you tell me the trees are plastic, I don't care. Again, not as tonally perfect as On a Real Good Day, but still works as showing the acceptance jerk has come to since that moment. It's a pretty good little review. I, uh, <laughs> I believe part one is uh, my most viewed video. It just recently passed 50,000 views, so that's nice. Part three is the longest, so it makes sense that that wouldn't necessarily... <laughs> yeah, exactly. People start watching it and they give up. <laughs> <laughs> my... Top three or four favorite criticisms you make of the film are one, as I mentioned before, the line about this isn't even pretentious. You need ambition right. to be pretentious. Like, I love that because I never would have thought of that. Like, that that notion of people talk about pretentious like it's a shitty, lazy thing, but it's possible to be lazier than yeah, pretentious. Absolutely. And this film does it. My second is... The line you have where you say, this is more style over substance than the cheesiest light parade on Main yeah. Street. Like... That is such a gut punch to the film where it's like <laughs> the thing you're criticizing is not as empty as you are. Partially because it's true. It's not just a clever line. It's like this film really has nothing substantive to offer and the style isn't entertaining. That's what bothers me so much about this style not being entertaining is the fact that if you had substance you were trying to convey and you failed to convey it entertainingly, it'd be like, Okay, no, it was a good concept, poor execution. This is a poor concept with a poor execution. There is literally one shot in the movie that impressed me from a production standpoint, and not even in a, oh, wow, I could never pull that shot off way, but just in a, oh, wow, I would never be bothered to pull that shot off <laughs> way. I could do it. I would never go through the effort. And it's the scene where they're on two different people mover cars right. and they pass each other at the right moment. I'm like, okay, I'm impressed you bothered to time out what it would take to get that shot. But why? But why? What's the See, point? the difference is... I'm the person who would have pushed for that shot. It, it's <laughs> As evidence for the fact that I pitched and was rejected for the upcoming Blitz Travelfornia. Hey, Dave, what if we had a car chase on Autopia? Like, we could time it. You know, there are spots where the track goes by. I could stand here and it's like, oh, wait, you'd be in a different car every time. And yeah. How do you get on this track versus that? And it was finally like... Okay, this is never going to happen. By the but way, I was like, no, we could do this. This could happen. By the way, I feel like that kind of shit was the real reason this movie wasn't black and white. So when they do retakes on Autopia, you don't yeah. notice that the cars are different colors. Oh, yeah. It's yeah, absolutely exactly. a huge portion of it. Like, is just how much easier it makes it to film. Like, you think about in Joss Whedon's Much Ado About Nothing, when he talks about, um, I think it's behind the scenes, or possibly the audio commentary, where he goes, yeah, in this shot there was a bright orange lawnmower in the background, <laughs> but it's black and white, so it worked. You don't notice yeah, it. Yeah, that's why he got fired from Marvel, is he wanted Ultron to be black and white. <laughs> just to make it. And I think that's a commentary. Um, see is you, it, though? See you next time I decide to do a commentary, folks. Bye-bye. But Bye. you won't see us, because it's a commentary. Mmm.